to Elijah, though, let's recap what we said about Jonah last week, or at least a little bit of what we said. Why did Jonah disobey God's call? Came down to, yeah, Joe? He didn't want to go to Nineveh, true, but is he just lazy, or why didn't he want to go? Yes, Steve. Or, yeah, he's prejudiced. He, uh, I think we can be even stronger than that. He hates the Ninevites. He hates them so much, he would rather not risk the possibility that God would show kindness to them. He might have relished the idea of pronouncing judgment on them, but he knew God's heart, and he didn't want at any cost to see God relent of judgment to the Ninevites. Now, how did Jonah survive in the great fish? It was miraculous. Remember, there's no way, as we can understand, for a human to survive inside of a whale or a fish, so it had to be a miraculous preservation. Now, in God's dealings with Jonah, which attributes did God demonstrate? Clearly demonstrates compassion. He does not give to Jonah what Jonah deserves. Jonah is disobedient. A prophet, of any, out of all people, should have been obedient to the Lord, but God is gracious to him, and... He's completely sovereign and powerful. He can orchestrate the storm, the casting of lots, a fish, miraculous preservation. He does all of these things. He demonstrates his total power. When Jonah goes to Nineveh, though, and actually preaches, what even greater miracle takes place? Exactly. All of the people repent from the greatest to the least of them. Everyone repents. This, uh, this Gentile city the greatest city in the Middle East at this time, they all repent, and God therefore relents of the judgment. Now, we didn't mention this last week, but just as an aside, remember, this is not God demonstrating inconstancy. God declares that he never changes, he never changes his mind. Well, didn't you change your mind if you said you were going to judge and then, and then you didn't? Well, God foreordained all of these actions, even his own responses, and he was acting completely consistent with his character. He is a God who is angry with the evil and proud, always, but he's always kind to the repentant and humble. And God's response to Nineveh was completely consistent with that character. He's consistent with his holiness and consistent with his compassion. But Jonah is angry with God's response. Why was Jonah's anger hypocritical? Yes, Steve. He accepted God's mercy. He experienced God's compassion, but he didn't want to see God do that to other people, this particular people group. Besides God's demonstrating his great compassion and power in the book of Jonah, why else was the book of Jonah written? Yes, Steve. That's true. It has um, some messianic implications. The sign of Jonah is something that Jesus is going to refer to for himself. But there's, that's, it's good that you say that because that points us to another aspect of the book of Jonah that even Jesus brings out. You're going to say something, Roy? I think so. Uh, some have pointed out that Jonah is in some ways almost symbolic of Israel, that um, he didn't want to, to share the, the good news with Nineveh just as Israel never really sought to be a witness to the other nations, it was just trying to reap the blessings for itself. But keying on, or even going further with the idea of Israel, remember that the book of Jonah is a work of contrast. Nineveh, the greatest city of the Gentiles, the most wicked city of the Gentiles, repents at the preaching of one prejudiced, half-hearted preacher. But Israel will not repent even though all these preachers, and even though they're God's people, are coming, or all these preachers are coming to them again and again. So it is a, um, it's an exposure of Israel's wickedness by way of contrast to the Ninevites. Israel's stubbornness, Israel's hard-heartedness. Israel had far more reason to repent and follow God, but they would not. And Nineveh had seemingly small reason to repent from a human perspective, and they do. Now, there was a question last week I heard after class about whether such a rebuke via the book of Jonah is truly fair. If salvation is only possible by the Lord's Spirit, as we know, then how can God get condemn Israel for not believing? True, Nineveh had less reason to repent, but they only repented because God moved them to repentance. 
if God didn't grant repentance to Israel, then how can God find fault with Israel? Ah, this is the classic misunderstanding of God's sovereignty that nullifies man's responsibility. Without spending a whole Sunday school lesson on it, let me just try and sum up the answer quickly. Man is responsible to believe in and obey God. He has every reason to do so, and any kind of blessing or extra revelation that man receives makes him even more culpable. But man, by his own choice, will not ever believe or obey God. He is <clears throat> man is bent toward rebellion. God does not force man's choice on this issue. Man brings upon himself his own deserved punishment. Man reaps what he sows. This was true of Adam, and it's true of us, his descendants. As Pastor taught recently, it is therefore impossible for any man to be saved unless God intervenes, unless uh, God makes the person choose differently than he would naturally. And this is what God does in salvation. He intervenes, he opens a man's eyes, he gives the man faith, he makes the man alive by the Holy Spirit so that the man cannot help but choose God, be saved, and experience God's blessing. Now, God's refusal to intervene for all is not blameworthy. You say, well, if you intervene for some, why don't you intervene for all? Isn't that not fair? God does not need to save any. He doesn't have to intervene for any person. The fact that any, are all, any at all are saved is an extremely surprising mercy. Therefore, for those who are damned, the responsibility and shame is entirely their own. They chose it. They reap the consequences of it. But for those who are saved, the responsibility and glory is entirely God's because God chose it, God accomplished it, God made it come to pass. Now, you, we, you can try and say, but well, logically, doesn't this make God responsible? Or doesn't this make man irresponsible? The Bible doesn't let you do that. The Bible does not let you argue otherwise. It states explicitly God does not force people to sin, and by extension, God does not force people to go to hell. God allows evil for his own purposes, but he categorically is not the author of evil or injustice of any sort. This is part of what makes salvation so wondrous. We could never have deserved it or even expected it. It was a big, merciful surprise. We would have justly perished like the rest. But God amazingly showed his loving kindness to us. Back to Israel. Even though we know Israel would never have turned to God without God's intervention, it is nonetheless true that Israel should have turned to God. They had every reason to do so. And the fact that they did not is even more blameworthy than those who had never experienced that special relationship to God or heard God's special revelation. Questions about that or about what we talked about regarding Jonah last week? Yes, Steve. Yeah, that's a good comment, Steve. Just to sum a little bit or repeat a little bit what you're saying. The, the account of Jonah and even these understandings of God's sovereignty and salvation, they really emphasize the mercy of God, the great compassion of God. And it is something for us to imitate. It is not something for us to be hypocritical about. And even with this situation with the, the shooting in the gay nightclub of, in, in Orlando, um, this is another instance where we should be thinking about um, having that attitude of mercy and extending mercy because it has been extended to us. And I also think about any time you see a tragedy or a natural disaster or something like that, it's always good to go back to the words of Jesus or the, when he talks about the tower that fell on certain people or those who were killed when they were offering sacrifices. He says, do you think they were more evil than you? I'll tell you no. But unless you perish or unless you repent, you will likewise perish. So it's not just, oh, oh they, were, you know, they were homosexual. They were, they were living a, a gay lifestyle. That's why it happened to them. We're all evil. We all deserve to have that kind of thing happen to us. 
there's no reason necessarily that it happened to one and not the other. We need to be, we need to learn the lesson and we need to get right with God because the same thing could happen to us. Other questions or comments? Okay. Well, the account of Jonah takes place in the middle of the divided kingdom period under Jeroboam II. But we're going to back up some years now and consider an earlier prophet, Elijah. Elijah was a fascinating individual, unique in many respects. He was a powerful servant of God, and yet he was just a man. He affected some of the most momentous miracles in the Old Testament, including raising a person from the dead. He was bold for the Lord and declared, as a prophet must, that the Israelites of the northern kingdom, that's where he ministered, they must repent and serve God. Elijah, you may remember, also is unique in that he never died, but he ascended to heaven how? In a chariot of fire. But Elijah was also a weak and failing prophet. In the book of Kings, we see him express both loneliness and despair. Like Jonah, Elijah at times asks for God to kill him because Elijah feels like, Elijah's the only God-fearer left in Israel. He's always on the run from people who want to kill him, and it feels like he's not strong enough to keep standing for the Lord. But God did sustain Elijah and even use this, at times, failing prophet in a powerful way. And of course, that, there's parallels for us there. We can't look at Elijah's whole prophetic ministry, but we are going to look at a few things today. Here's our outline. We're going to focus on the account of Elijah at Mount Carmel, but first looking at the historical context, the historical situation of that moment in Elijah's ministry, then we'll take a look at the contest itself between God and Baal at Carmel, and then we'll finish by considering application from this momentous event. Let's pray before we go on. Father, I pray that your greatness would be on display in this class, that you'd help me to be able to explain clearly and helpfully what your word says, and that we would grow in our understanding and love and fear God of you as the, as the one great God. And in Jesus' name, amen. Let's start by examining the context of the Carmel debacle. Please open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 17. If you're using the Bibles in the pews, this is on page 372. 1 Kings 17. I'm not going to read this whole chapter, but I will make reference to a couple of the verses in it. By the way, I'm going to try and use the laser pointer function. Is that showing up? Oh, yeah, you can kind of see it. Nice. As I said, we're in the divided kingdom period, around 900 BC, about 100 years before Jonah's ministry. At this time, the infamous Ahab is king of Israel. Remember, Israel being the northern kingdom. Jeroboam I, that was the first king of, the first king of Israel, was pretty evil, but Ahab was even more wicked. One evil act of Ahab was his marriage. Ahab married a Phoenician princess, Jezebel, and made her queen of Israel. Phoenicia, by the way, I think you can see it on the map in the top middle, is the area that included the coastal cities of Tyre and Sidon. It was northwest of Israel, modern Lebanon. Jezebel is from Phoenicia, and he brings, she brings into Israel the worship of Baal. Now, you remember... Baal. Baal is sometimes a, sometimes the Baals is just a generic term for all the gods of the nations. But Baal specifically usually refers to a particular god. This is the, uh, he had a regional variance, but this is the chief of the gods of the Canaanites and of the Phoenicians. Some regarded him as the god of the sun, but most worshippers viewed him as the god of storms. He had power over dew, rainfall, lightning, very similar to Zeus of the Greeks and Marduk of the Babylonians. Because of his impact on crops, he's also associated with fertility. Now, Israel is a region very dependent on rainfall. So, very quickly, Baal, this Baal becomes popular. Now, enter Elijah. Chapter 17, verse 1, introduces Elijah as, an, as Elijah has a message from God to the king of Israel. Look at verse 1 of chapter 17. Now, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers, settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Now we can notice a few things from just this one statement. 
First of all, Elijah is called a Tishbite. That just means he's from the town of Tishbe. I'm not exactly sure where that was, but it was, he said also to be from Gilead, which would be the northeast area of Israel, where my little pointer is now. That would be the region of Gilead. Tishbe must be somewhere in that area. Now notice his proclamation of judgment. No rain or dew in Israel until Elijah says so. Why is this a poignant judgment? Are those random judgments? No, it's very purposeful, right? Why? Yeah, Judy. Exactly. That is, the, that is precisely the area that their false god, this new god that is get, becoming popular in Israel, is supposed to rule over. He's supposed to bring the dew. He's supposed to bring the rain. And God says, because you've turned to the god of the sky, the god who's supposed to give you dew and rain, I'm going to not have any dew or rain in your, in your area until I say so. This is a very purposeful judgment. Now, after this, the Lord instructs Elijah to flee. Already, Elijah is on the run. He is constantly on the run. I think of him as kind of like a running prophet. He has to flee. And at first, he hides at the book Kareth in Gilead. So he's going back to this northeast section. He's miraculously provided for there. But as the drought... Oh, okay, good. As the drought continues, the brook dries up, and God directs him to another place, to a city called Zarephath. You've probably heard of that. But where is Zarephath? Well, let's look at verses 8 to 9 of chapter 17. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. And behold, behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Zarephath is in Sidon. Or in other words, what kingdom? Phoenicia. Don't remember, Phoenicia is right up here. You can see uh, Zarephath would be in between Tyre and Sidon, about where my pointer is. And God sends Elijah to a widow in Zarephath. But not just any widow. Look down to verse 12. At this point, Elijah has asked the widow for some food and water. Notice her response. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I am gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. All right, this is a pretty, this is a very informative statement from this widow. What do we learn about her? She's poor. She's clearly poor. And connected with that, I think we can also say the famine produced by the drought is indeed severe. She has almost no food. And you can see how poverty and having no food fit together. With no rain, there are little to no crop yields, which means by the law of supply and demand, the price of food goes way up. A poor widow can no longer afford to buy food to live, and there's no welfare or handout system and no crops to glean, even if that were allowed in the area. So she's doomed. She's poor. The famine is severe. But we also learn something else about her. She knows about God and seems to have some fear of him. Because notice her first statement. She says, as the Lord your God lives. She's making an oath by Yahweh. Now, she does say your God. I don't know if we can read too much into that. But she doesn't necessarily know too much about Elijah, and yet she's already swearing by Yahweh. She has some fear, maybe even faith in Yahweh. And what happens right after this is that Elijah tells her to do something that would be kind of scary to do. He says, oh, give me the food that you have, and don't worry, you won't run out. And she believes him. She obeys. She has faith. So I think we're looking at somebody here who actually is a believer in Yahweh and exercises true faith. So what we see here is the same sad irony that we saw with Jonah. Israel is persisting in idolatry, turning after Baal. Meanwhile, the place where Baal comes from, Phoenicia, has a widow who's turning to and remaining faithful to Yahweh. This is a persistent theme in the divided kingdom period and among the prophets. Hard-hearted Israel will not turn to God, but pagan Gentiles, not all of them, but some of them, do turn to God. 
even though they have far less reason to do so. As with Jonah, Jesus again points out this idea and makes a parallel to his own day. If you don't mind, turn real quick to Luke chapter 4. Keep your finger in 1 Kings. But Luke chapter 4, Jesus is in his hometown, and he says some pretty interesting words. Luke 4, verses 23 to 27. Page 1024 in the Pew Bibles. Luke chapter 4, verse 23. And he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath and the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Hopefully you can appreciate Jesus' point here. He is saying what I was just saying. Hard-hearted Israel consistently rejects God's prophets while pagan Gentiles believe and they get to experience God's mercy and blessing. Jesus, by saying no prophet has honor in his own town, you're going to be quoting certain prophet, um, proverbs to me, he foretells that they will do the exact same thing to him and his message. By the way, what's the crowd's reaction to Jesus' words? They try to kill him. They get his point. He's shaming them. He's saying, you're hard-hearted and you won't listen to God's message, but the pagans will, the Gentiles will, and they don't like that and they try and kill Jesus, but it's not his time. They can't do it and Jesus leaves. By the way, how long does Jesus say the famine in Elijah's day lasted? Three and a half years. Now that is a mega drought and that's going to result in severe famine. Can you imagine three and a half years with zero rain and no dew? There's no water anywhere in Israel and probably in the surrounding regions. Israel must have been a dry and dusty wasteland. Severe food shortages. People are probably trying to import food as best they can, consuming the livestock that they've raised. But there are still many starving people, many starving animals. It's a total catastrophe. But why did this happen? Because they turned to Baal and because they turned to false gods. Oh, Ahab, oh, Israel, why do you persist in your stubborn idolatry? Three and a half years. Has Baal truly served you well? Will you not subject yourself to the true God who actually does have power over rainfall? But Israel and its king do not repent. Meanwhile, God miraculously provides for this Phoenician widow and Elijah, his prophet, until God is ready to visit Israel again in an act of undeserved compassion. Let's actually see what God does. We've looked at the background of the context of Carmel. Now let's look at the episode of Carmel itself. Back to 1 Kings. Back to 1 Kings chapter 18 now, page 373 in the Pew Bibles. This is going to be our main passage today. We're going to look at the whole thing. It's 46 verses, so bear with me as I read it. Follow along. Now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For when Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water. Then Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we will find grass and keep the horses and mules alive and not have to kill some of the cattle. So they divided the land between them to survey it. Ahab went one way by himself and Obadiah went another way by himself. Now as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him and he recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is this you, Elijah, my master? He said to him, It is I. Go say to your master, Behold, Elijah is here. He said, what sin have I committed that you are giving your servant into the hand of Ahab to put me to death? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent to search for you. And when they said he is not here, he made the kingdom or nation swear that they could not find you. 
And now you are saying, go say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. It will come about when I leave you that the spirit of the Lord will carry you where I do not know. So, th so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told to my master what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord that I hid? or that I hid a hundred prophets of the Lord by fifties in a cave and provided them with bread and water? And now you are saying, go say to your master, behold, Elijah is here. He will then kill me. Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is this you, you troubler of Israel? He said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. Now then, send and gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel, together with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent a message among all the sons of Israel and brought the prophets together out at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Now let them give us two oxen, and let them choose one ox for themselves, and cut it up and place it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other ox and lay it on the wood, and I will not put a fire under it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, That is a good idea. So Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one ox for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. And they took the ox which was given them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they leaped about the altar, which they made. It came about at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Call out with a loud voice, for he is a god. Either he is occupied or gone aside or is on a journey. Or perhaps he is asleep and needs to be awakened. So they cried with a loud voice and cut themselves, according to their custom, with swords and lances until the blood gushed out on them. When midday was passed, they raved, until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there is no voice. No one answered, and no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two measures of seed. Then he arranged the wood and cut the oxen pieces and laid it on the wood, and he said, Fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and slew them there. Now Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is the sound of the roar of a heavy shower. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, but Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he crouched down on the earth and put his face between his knees. He said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. So he went up and looked, and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go back, seven times. And it came about at the seventh time that he said, Behold, a cloud as small as a man's hand is coming up from the sea. And he said, Go up. Say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down, 
so that the heavy shower does not stop you. In a little while the sky grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy shower. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and outran Ahab to Jezreel. Pretty amazing. Amazing that this actually happened, that this is history, but it's been recorded for our instruction, so let's study it. We'll start with basic observations. God tells Elijah to show himself to Ahab. Afterward, what does God promise to do? I will send rain. Not, not I will think about sending rain, I will send rain. God arranges an audience for Elijah with Ahab via this man, Obadiah. Now, Obadiah is a righteous man. What has Obadiah done without the king's knowledge? He hid a hundred prophets of Yahweh and provided food and water for them. Now, why did they need to be hidden? Jezebel was executing God's prophets. There's a definite need. Elijah tells Obadiah to tell Ahab that Elijah wants to see him. But Obadiah hesitates. Why? What's uh, Obadiah's fear? Yeah, great. Oh, yeah, that, that God might hide Elijah, that God might carry Elijah away. Yeah, he says, we've been looking everywhere for you. Ahab has sent four nations looking for you. And now you tell me to go tell Ahab I found you? God might ke- take you away, and then Ahab's going to kill me. He's going to be so angry that he's going to kill me. But Elijah reassures o- Obadiah. And by the way, we're getting a picture of the character of the two rulers of Israel at this time. Jezebel and Ahab, very, very wicked. But Elijah does meet with Ahab. What does Ahab call Elijah? Troubler of Israel. You troubler of Israel. Elijah turns the phrase around. I have not troubled Israel, but you and your fathers have. And how have they done so, according to Elijah? By turning to Baal. That's right, by turning to Baal and by forsaking the commandments of the Lord. He says, you are the troubler of Israel. Then Elijah commands Ahab to assemble the people of Israel and 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the Asherah at Mount Carmel. Now recall that Asherah is a term that refers to a wooden tree-like image or pole, probably shaped to depict a goddess. Asherah likely depicted Ashtoreth, the principal female deity of the Canaanites and the Phoenicians, goddess of love, sex, fertility, and war. Baal and Ashtoreth were the two main deities of the Phoenicians, so it makes sense that these deities would become principal deities in Israel with the inauguration provided by the queen from Phoenicia, the princess of Phoenicia, Jezebel. So he says, bring both of those groups of prophets. Notice also that it says the prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth eat at Jezebel's table. Jezebel is directly honoring and supporting these prophets. Elijah orders these 850 prophets come to Carmel. Where's Carmel? Well, I provided a map for you. Carmel Mountain Range is on the northwest section of Israel. So where my pointer is now, Mount Carmel will be right around here. So this is not too far from where Phoenicia is. If we just go a little bit north, we would find this is where Tyre and Sidon are. So pretty close to Phoenicia and very close to the coast. Now the people of Israel gathered at Carmel. Elijah asked them to make a decision. What's, what decision? Decide today which God you're going to follow, God or Baal. This may remind you of another episode in Israel's history. Where else have we heard a man of God tell the people to choose between God and other gods? Joshua, right? Joshua toward the end of his life. Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's where that that verse comes from. Don't vacillate any longer between two opinions. You can't serve God and Baal. Choose one or the other. During the time of Joshua, the people affirmed that they would follow Yahweh. But here, nobody answers Elijah. Now, Elijah proclaims himself at Carmel. Are you going to say something, George? No, no, I was talking. Okay, sorry. (laughs) Now, Elijah proclaims himself at Carmel to be the only prophet left of God. Is this true? No, No, we already heard earlier in the passage that there are a hundred other prophets that were hid by Obadiah. I'm not quite sure why he says that. 
this is a strange insistence of Elijah that he even repeats to the Lord later. Maybe he's just saying this because in this instance, he's the only prophet. Not, there are 450 prophets of Baal. I'm the only prophet of the Lord here. Or maybe he just felt alone. Technically true, yes, there were other prophets, but he felt like he was the only one left. Now at Carmel, Elijah tells the people that they're going to prove once and for all which God is God. And it's going to happen with a test. Both Elijah and the prophets of Baal will arrange sacrifices on altars, but what will be missing from these sacrifices? Fire. There will be no fire. And you need fire to present a sacrifice. It needs to burn. It will be, then, the God who answers his worshipers with fire from heaven to burn the sacrifice will prove himself to be the real God. People like the idea, so the contest is on. By the way, why is fire from heaven an appropriate test for Baal? He's the God of storms. He's the God in control of the heavens. Fire from heaven should be his wheelhouse, in his wheelhouse. It's appropriate for him. It's even possible that fire from heaven may actually refer to lightning. I mean, that's exactly what he's supposed to preside over. Remember, they don't have a concept of electricity. So what is lightning? Well, it's a bright, flashing fire. So perhaps the idea of fire from heaven is simply lightning. Whichever God answers with fire or lightning from heaven, and certainly lighten, lightning would cause something to burn, that will be the real God. This should be Baal's strong point. And the prophets of Baal go first. What do they do to try and get Baal to send fire? We can actually see a progression in what they do. What's the first thing? Well, first it says they call on him. We don't know the intensity of that call, but they call on him. Then they start leaping around the altar. Then, what do they do? Well, before they cut themselves, it says they cry with a loud voice, so they're getting more intense in their call, and then they cut themselves. Cut themselves, gash themselves with swords and lances till the blood gushes out. And then finally it says that they rave. <clears throat> they're getting more and more, uh, what's the word, not eccentric. Uh, they're going more and more crazy trying to, get, trying to get Baal to answer. Ecstatic, I think, is the word I was looking for. Now, how long do they try to get Baal's attention? How much time goes by? The entire morning into, into the evening, or technically the afternoon. It says the time of the evening sacrifice, which as best we understand is about 3 o'clock. But the morning begins at 6 a.m. So how many hours is that? 6 to 3 in the afternoon? Nine, Nine hours. Nine hours. But what is the result? Nothing. And the text tells us this twice. Verse 26, but there was no voice, no one answered. And verse 29, there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. Talk about awkward and embarrassing. Nine hours of 450 prophets crying out, leaping, gashing themselves for nothing. Elijah even mocks them, suggesting they should cry louder because... Well, maybe your God's occupied, the verb suggests meditation. Maybe he's deep in thought. You've got to cry loud to shake him out of his trance. Or maybe he's gone aside, the verb suggests private withdrawal. It even has the connotation of removing waste, so it can be translated, maybe he's relieving himself. It's actually the way the ESV translates this verse. Or maybe he's on a journey. The gods were said to often journey to various places in the world. Better hope he gets back in time. Shout so that he hurries back. Or maybe he's asleep. The gods were said to take time to sleep too. Maybe your god is snoozing. Better shout to wake him up. Well, there's absolutely no response. Their raving is useless. And it soon becomes Elijah's turn. Elijah repairs an altar of Yahweh that was at the site, an altar that had been torn down. And he repairs it using 12 stones, one stone for each tribe of Israel. Elijah kills and prepares the sacrifice at the time of the evening offering. But he goes even further. What is he ordered to be done to the wood and the sacrifice? Douse it with water. Douse it three times with four pitchers of water. So this is a fair amount of water. There's so much water poured over the sacrifice that the water flows all over the altar, and the trench around the altar is also filled with water, either filled with additional water or with a runoff from the altar. Now, how well do wet things burn? Not very well. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's impossible to burn things that are wet. As long as it's wet, it's not going to burn. You have to dry it first. So the odds are stacked against Elijah and Yahweh. 
but Elijah simply prays. What four desires does Elijah express in his prayer? God, make yourself known as the true God of Israel. What else? Dwayne. Yeah, he says, answer me. Uh, so uh, that's his most basic desire, but why, why does he want him to answer him? Well, one reason we've said is to make yourself known as the one true God. What else? That I'm your servant. I'm your true prophet. What else? Um, the people may see what? Yeah, so he does actually say that twice, but as we've mentioned, show yourself to be the true God. Show yourself to be the real existent God. What else? That's right. I'm not only your true prophet, but everything I've done has been in obedience to you. And then one more thing. One surprising thing he wants the people to know. Yes. Notice that last one. Uh, let me see if I can find the verse again. Yeah, 37. Answer me that this people may know that, oh, that you, O oh, oh, Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. You have turned their heart back again. We'll come back to that a little bit later. Now, God does answer his prayer. What burns up? Everything burns up. The wood burns up. The sacrifice burns up. The stones of the altar burn up, and those are not flammable. The dust of the ground burns up. And even the water in the trench is licked up. There's basically only a crater left where the altar was. God didn't just send fire. He sent fire. How did the people react? They turned to the Lord to be God. They confess the Lord to be God. They fall on their faces and proclaim, the Lord, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. Just as it was emphatic that there's no one home for Baal, it was repeated twice, so it's emphatic that God is true and his presence is there. I am, he is God. I am, he is God. Elijah then orders all 450 prophets of Baal seized. They're taken to the brook, the brook Kishon, which on the map flows here on the eastern side of Carmel, the Carmel mountain range. So it would have been nearby. Taken to the brook Kishon, and the prophets are killed there. We're not told what happens to the 400 prophets of Asherah. They don't seem to uh, feature in this account but they probably were recognized as false prophets and killed too. After telling Ahab to eat and drink, Elijah goes back up to Carmel, puts his head between his knees. He then tells his servant to go up and look at the sea seven times. Remember, Carmel's right here on the coast, so it had been totally doable to look towards the sea. And uh, he asks him to report what he sees. Doesn't see anything, but the seventh time he sees a small cloud. Elijah then tells the servant to tell Ahab, you better go home in your chariot now because a heavy rain is coming. Ahab sets out for Jezreel, which is uh, right about here, about 15 to 25 miles from Mount Carmel. This would have been the winter capital of Ahab in the northern kingdom. Sets out with his chariot, but what amazing detail closes the chapter. Elijah outruns the chariot to Jezreel. The hand of the Lord is upon him, and he's able to outrun him. I tell you, Elijah is the runner. He's always running. Anyways, let's take all these observations and interpret. And I'll we'll work through some basic ones and then get to some more complex ones. What is Elijah doing at the end of the account with his head between his knees? He's praying. It's not stated directly, but that's certainly what he's doing. He's praying, and what is he praying? He's praying for the rain to return because it's right after he does all this that the rain comes. By the way, if you're looking for biblical prayer postures, Here's one. We can call it the uh, Elijah, head between the knees. James 5, 17 to 18, by the way, backs up our conclusion here. Speaking about Elijah, James says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain on the earth and produced its fruit. And that's exactly what we're seeing here at the end of this chapter. Backing up a little bit, why does Ahab call Elijah the troubler of Israel? How has Elijah troubled Israel? Yeah, he, he says, you brought the famine. You proclaimed the famine. It's your fault. You brought the lack of rain. You brought the drought. You brought the famine. 
But Elijah makes clear, the blame for the drought belongs to the wicked king, not God and God's holy prophet. By the way, this is a typical response of the proud heart of man, is it not? Rather than facing up to the consequences of his own sin, the sinner blames others, especially God. For example, a child violates class rules, gets a detention, but he blames the teacher for being mean. Not my fault. The rules are too strict. The teacher is too mean. Or a husband pays no attention to his wife, and when she confronts him about it, he excuses his behavior by saying, why would I want to be around you when you only complain? Won't admit the fault, blame someone else. Or even more generally, many people say, if God were really good, why is there so much suffering in the world? Ah, the problem is not God's lack of goodness or his lack of love. It's man's sin. It's not God's fault. It's our fault. We did this to ourselves. God's not the one responsible. We are the ones responsible. It's the same with Ahab and Elijah. Ahab is responsible with his sin for the judgment on Israel, not Elijah and not God. Now, why does Elijah have the false prophets killed? Isn't that a little brutal, a little extreme? Okay, that's certainly true. Just from a practical standpoint, it's, uh, it would be better for these prophets to die than for the people to persist in their idolatry and the whole nation to be killed. But there's a more direct reason that we can uh, justify Elijah. Yeah, it's commanded in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 13, uh, 5. But the prophet of that dreamer of dreams, speaking of the, the one who is proclaiming other gods, shall be put to death because he has counseled rebellion against the Lord your God, who brought you from the land of slavery and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk. So you shall purge the evil from among you. Now, remember, we're not Israel. This is not a prescription for us today. We're not to go around killing false prophets or false teachers. This was God's provision for that special nation at that special time. With three years of drought, with the contest of fire from heaven, and with the reintroduction of rain into Israel, what does God show about Baal? He is not a real God, and he has no power. I mean, you can't have arranged a more comprehensive exposure of Baal's impotence. I mean, think about it. When the people start worshiping the God of rain and storms and turn away from Yahweh, they get three and a half years of no rain. Then, when the God of the sky is called upon to send fire or lightning from the sky, which he should be able to do, he can't do it. But Yahweh can do it, and he does it emphatically. And finally, when the people turn away from this sky God, and they kill his prophets, and they turn back to Yahweh, what happens? Rain returns to the land. The conclusion is clear. Baal is not God. Yahweh is God. Couldn't have been made more clearly. Now, of course, Baal is not the only impotent God. All so-called gods and, art and idols are just as powerless and useless as Baal. We don't have time to explore this today, but I think you'll find it very edifying if you do a word search on the word idols in the Old Testament. Look at the passages in which they appear. So often, especially in the prophets, books like Ezekiel, Jeremiah, you hear the writers decry vain idols or mute idols as being totally useless. These idols and their gods, they can't see, they can't hear, and they can't speak. They can't move. They can't even prevent their idols from falling over. They can't save. They can't do anything. The Bible even literally calls idol worshipers stupid. The people who go after idols are stupid, it says. Totally useless. Now, Elijah mocks the prophets of Baal. Are Christians to imitate? Are Christians free to mock false religions, adherence to false religions, and false teachers? What do you think? Yeah, Joe. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good cautious stance, and I'm going to explore a little bit. I don't know if we want to go so far as to say mock, but certainly we want to expose the folly of false religion. We should note, looking at Elijah's behavior here, God remembered that principle of interpreting historical narrative. Just because a person does it, or just because a righteous person does it, does not mean that you should necessarily do it too. They're just reporting that it happened, not saying that you should do it. 
However, if we look at the example of Jesus and the apostles in the New Testament, we can see some interesting things. They never speak rudely or harshly to any unbeliever, except, I wouldn't use the word rudely, they do speak harshly to false teachers. They speak harshly to and about false teachers. For example, Jesus calls the Pharisees, you may remember, blind guides, whitewashed tombs, among other things. Jude, in his letter, calls false teachers wandering stars and wild waves full of sea garbage. Paul expresses in the book of Galatians a wish that those teaching circumcision as necessary for salvation would go all the way and emasculate themselves. Why these severe words? Well, it's because of the dangers that these false teachers present, not only to themselves, but also to others. People need to appreciate the level of evil and danger connected with these teachers. They need to be exposed with severe words. Now, these words are never juvenile or flippant, nor do they denigrate someone's appearance or speech. They are thoughtful denunciations of grave evil, of the behavior and teaching of false teachers. Now, what about mocking religions or religious practices? Here's my opinion. It is right for us to point out the absurdity, folly, and inconsistency of false worship. But we want to be very cautious about how we do so. Because worship is serious. It's not a subject to be approached rudely, flippantly, or cavalierly. So I think when we think of mocking, we think about people being simply rude or um, flippant. I don't think that's really what we're to, that's the, really the way we're supposed to act. We should expose folly, but not in a way that is shameful or unhelpful. Final question, interpretive question I want to ask. Why did God choose to send rain again to Israel? Because right at the very beginning, he says, go see Ahab, and afterwards I will send rain. Why? That's right. We Remember that detail he says, Elijah says, let them know that you have turned their hearts back. Now, why is God turning their hearts back? Have they done anything to deserve it? <laughs> yeah, that's a great point, a great observation. The, the reminders in the text and in Elijah's prayer, they point back to the covenant that God made with Abraham and by extension his descendants, a covenant of love, a covenant of faithfulness. God is remembering his covenant and choosing to act in compassion, but not simply by to send rain. He's not going to violate his holiness. He's not going to violate his... Um, the other part of his covenant which says, when you turn away from me, I'm going to judge you. He's going to fulfill both his compassionate and his holy nature by granting repentance and then granting rain. Now, this is just the start of a movement toward repentance. Elijah probably thought that everything was going to turn around all at once. And so he gets extremely discouraged. We don't see it here, but it comes in the next chapter. chapter when he finds out that Jezebel, undeterred by the death of her prophets, is actually still trying to kill Elijah. But revival is starting here in the northern kingdom. And it would later culminate under Elisha and a later king, Jehu. As a result of this revival, Baal worship is almost entirely purged from the northern kingdom. This was a gracious act of God. Now, this devotion to God doesn't last in the northern kingdom. And not even everybody is on board, surely, at the start or throughout it. But it is a period of mercy. It is an act of compassion from a holy God to this particular generation and moving their hearts back towards him and then sending rain. None of this was deserved. None of this was even to be expected. But God, out of his kind heart, determined to send relief to Israel through rain and thus determined first to send repentance to make that rain possible. So we're seeing once again, like with Jonah, we see the compassionate, beautiful, holy heart of God questions about what we've looked at? Yes, Joe. Okay. 
Okay, very good question. We won't have time to fully explore this today, but I will try and say something about it. He's asking, what about the demonic power behind Baal? Is there, what kind of power is there? Uh, because Joe didn't say it specifically, but the Bible does associate idols with demons. Is there demonic power behind idols? Well, it's really interesting that if you examine what the Bible says about idols, it has two strands of thought. They're not contradictory. They're just, uh, I guess, two ways of looking at it. One is that idols are completely powerless. They're useless. There's no one home. Another is that idols are associated with demons. Even in the book of 1 Corinthians, you can see that in one chapter he says, an idol is nothing. It doesn't matter if you eat food sacrificed to idols. But then in a later chapter he says, I don't want you participating in idolatrous feasts because there are demons associated with idols. I don't want you to partake with demons. How can those things be true at the same time? Again, without getting full, fully into it, I think that there is an association with demons, but that doesn't mean that there is a demonic power to idols. At least not in the sense of those idols being able to do anything for you. There is a dangerous nature to idols because of demons. There's a bewitching um, character to idols, which is why we have to flee from idols. But it's not that the demons have some sort of power that idol worshippers get to tap into. No, the idols are still useless. I mean, even if we think about, even if we were to say, oh, the, the, the demons are there, they might give some power to the idol or the idol worshippers. Remember, who's, under, who's in control of the demons? God. They can't do anything without God allowing them to. And they can never accomplish anything except for God's own purposes. Now, again, he's not responsible for the evil, but he allows it for his own purposes. Anyway, you slice it. Idols don't have power. Demons ultimately don't have power. It's God. God is the only one with power. He's the only one that can help you. He's the only one that can save you. So we could probably say more about that. There's an association with demons with idols, but it's still nonetheless true that idols are powerless. False gods are powerless. They cannot do anything for you. Other questions? All right, let's consider just a couple of application questions as we close. The passage makes clear that physical idols provide no true help or ability. How is this truth directly relevant today? Physical idols provide no true help or salvation. How is this directly relevant today? Are there physical idols in the world? Yes, there are. Where? I mean, various religions have them. Yes, yeah, Steve? Hmm. Oh, wow. <laughs> the, uh, wow, okay. I didn't know about that. So, uh, just repeat what Steve was saying. On Route 27, there's a Buddhist temple, I guess, with a... Oh, it's someone's backyard. Okay, someone's backyard with a huge image of Buddha there. And certainly we know that Hinduism, Shintoism, various other religions, they include idols, actual idols. But the Bible makes clear those idols have no ability. Those gods are not home. There's no one there. They can't help you. There's also another relevance, though, for some some statues that are not called idols, some images that are not referred to as idols. Even in Christianity, there are sects that pray to or honor images, like Roman Catholicism, Greek Orthodoxy. The same word about idols needs to be declared there as well. The saints are not home. No one hears, no one understands, no one pays attention. Mary and the saints have no ability to help you. You're not listening. The only one who has the ability to help you is Christ. And really, saints are just relabeled versions of ancient Greek and Roman gods in the first place. These are useless and vain idols. People need to turn from them. But it's not just the physical idols. How is this text relevant for idols of the heart? Well, we've only got about a minute left, so we don't have full time to explore this. But it's true in the same way. Take any idol of the heart. Or for example, wealth. It is deceptive, and then it, it, it seems to have power. Oh, look what I can do with wealth. Look at how it's going to satisfy me. Look at how it's going to secure me. No, it's not true. The more wealth you have, the less satisfied you are with it. And the security it seems to provide to you can be taken away at any moment. And there's some things that wealth just can't help you with, most notably your own sin and death. Wealth can't stop that. But Yahweh, 
He can do all the things that wealth can't do. He can satisfy you. He can provide for you. He can make you secure until your time on earth is done. And he can deal with the most important thing. He can save you. He can save you from your sins and give you eternal life. All idols of their heart conform to the pattern that physical idols do. They seem to offer power. They seem to offer satisfaction. But they don't actually. Yahweh does. And finally, we've already broached this, so we don't have to spend time on it now. If idols are empty and useless, why is it so important to stay away from them? Well, they don't have power to save. They do have the power to cause one to stumble. They can capture you. They can bewitch you. They are extremely deceptive because they play on the flesh, or the fleshly nature that remains with us, and they use false promises to appeal to that fleshly nature. So even though an idol is powerless, it doesn't mean it's not dangerous. We must unmask idols for what they are, and if we're involved with an idol, we need to get as far away from it as possible because it, will, it has like a gravity to it. It'll try and keep us with it. All right, that's all we have time for today. We've talked about Elijah. Next time, we're talking about Elisha, Elijah's successor. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this amazing truth, the way you expose idols and show yourself to be the only one with power, the only one with true power, the only one who can truly help. Thank you that you have helped us, continue to help us, provide for us, God, and cause us, turn our hearts to you, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.